buy into the idea of strength in numbers, then Massachusetts is getting stronger. The latest census data shows the Bay State gained almost 50,000 new residents between 2012 and 2013. That influx is driving up demand for housing in already densely populated areas. In part two of our Growing Pains Focus Report, WGBH News reporter Stephanie Lydon takes us to a local forest that could soon be converted into a very large-scale apartment complex. It's 7 a.m. and the rush hour traffic is beginning to back up along Route 2 near the Alewife Tea Station. But nearby, Anne-Marie Lambert and Quinton Zondervan are walking in a different world. We've heard the traffic from Route 2 and some of the construction vehicles from uh, the nearby developments. So we're really right next to uh, development, um, but in this magnificent forest. Known to locals as the Silver Maple Forest, it's 15 acres of privately owned woods and thicket, wedged between Route 2 and the Elwife Brook Reservation. You can see this is the entrance to the Silver Maple Forest, and you can see the, the Silver Maples. They have a nice, very long branches that bend in a very particular way. For Zondervan, the lush trees and foliage remind him a little of his native Suriname. It's not quite the jungle, but it's as close as you're going to get in New England. It's located right next to a tea stop. It's very easy for people to come here and experience a little bit of nature. Zondervan and Lambert are among those fighting to save the forest, which straddles the Belmont-Cambridge line. A developer wants to build a 298-unit apartment complex on the Belmont side. The two say that will destroy the forest, one of the few remaining natural spaces in what has become a very dense neighborhood. If you add in the 298 units that are proposed here in Belmont, I to the 3,100 units <laughs> that you guys have been doing in Cambridge and continue to do since 2005. Yeah. That's a lot of housing units. Yeah, there's a lot of concern in, in Cambridge, I know, about all the development that's going on out here. State Senator Will Brownsberger, who represents Belmont, has long sought to protect the Silver Maple Forest from development. The strategy that I had in mind was that maybe the state could put some money on the table and that the communities of Arlington, Belmont, and Cambridge could come up with some money and we could uh, reach a deal. But his bill to acquire the land and make it part of the Alewife Brook Reservation never came to fruition. I put the legislation to that effect on the governor's desk, but the governor vetoed that legislation. I don't agree with the decision, but I do understand where his administration was coming from. That's because the proposed Belmont complex includes 60 affordable units, and the governor has made affordable housing a priority. So that's a legitimate countervailing concern, and I think that's why, in fact, the legislature is so far, I mean, the governor has, has, has not been supportive of, of putting money in place to acquire it. Back among the trees, Quinton Zondervan and Anne-Marie Lambert say they recognize the need for housing, but say that the scale of development has gotten out of hand. Of course, we have affordable housing challenges in the state and in, and in our town, but it seemed like we ought to be able to find a way to compensate the owner and show that the value of the land preserved is um, much greater than the value of the land developed. And as they walk one more time in the Silver Maple Forest, they fear it may be the last time. For WGBH News, I'm Stephanie Lydon. We reached out to the O'Neill Properties, the developer of the proposed apartment complex, but they declined to comment. So how can we balance the demand for more housing and the desire for natural open spaces? Andre LaRue is executive director of the Massachusetts Smart Growth Alliance, and we want to welcome him tonight. Nice to have you here. Thank you. So let's talk a little bit about some of the numbers first um, when it comes to uh, the need for housing. Has, has real estate been that shortage? There in that package, it sounded like there's a lot of real estate available in Cambridge. Well, anybody who uh, lives in the Boston area knows just how high the housing, uh, housing prices have gotten. And uh, even though our population's grown a little bit over the last few years, we still lose people to other uh, states, particularly parts of the country that have lower housing costs. So here, um, you know, it's been estimated that we would need another 28,000 units of housing to build just to bring us uh, on par with the vacancy rates that other states experience. And do they deal with these kinds of issues differently if maybe it's suburb versus in the city? Well, in the, you know, for the last 60 years, we had a 
development that was really oriented around the automobile. That's what drove suburban development after World War II. And everybody wanted to have uh, their own lot uh, in their house and the white picket fence, very mm -hmm. classic suburban notion. But over the last few years, that is, uh, the real estate market has flipped on its head, where you have the baby boomers and the millennial generation, the two biggest generations right now, uh, are both want to be back, come back to the cities, and so it's put an enormous amount of pressure on uh, urban places. And so places like you know Cambridge and Belmont, and Somerville, and parts of Boston have uh, never went down during the recession. They've always just sure. gone up. Absolutely. Let's bring in our next guest. This is Ted Landsmark. And today, by the way, is his first day as a member of the Board of Directors on the Boston Redevelopment Authority. He is Mayor Marty Walsh's first appointment to the BRA Board. We want to say congratulations, sir. Well, thank you very much. What a it's, terrific uh, honor for you. It's going to be a great challenge. Let's talk a little bit about this issue that we're talking about here. And I know that you've looked at other communities, and we're not the only ones who have faced this kind of issue. How are they dealing with this kind of development and keeping the balance? Well, first of all, uh, new development has to be done in concert with what the environment is. And for a long time, developers have uh, felt that they could simply go in and bulldoze what was there, not necessarily build uh, developments that fit in well uh, with the environmental context. Uh, when you travel around the country, and particularly when you travel to parts of Europe where land is very scarce, one of the first things you see is that there's almost always a design solution that is available to a developer, a way of citing a project, a way of changing the configuration of the project, uh, a way of building the project in a way that takes advantage of more sensitive design options that are available so that you don't necessarily have to destroy the natural environment in order to meet the housing need. Are you concerned about the project in Cambridge? Well, I haven't looked at it yet closely, but any project, uh, uh, particularly in an area that's already uh, fairly densely populated, is one that one needs to be concerned about in terms of how it fits and what it does to preserve uh, natural land, right. wildlife, and all of the uh, immediate uh, environs. Uh, in Boston and in uh, adjacent areas, we're spending a lot of time now thinking about water management and about how we go about dealing with the uh, possible mitigation of uh, environmental forces that um, may uh, really change our environment in a very major way. And developers, it seems to me, need to be uh, brought to a point where they understand that sensitivity needs to uh, be uh, demonstrated in terms of protecting the environment. Sure. Andre, talk to us a little bit about some projects in the past that have been good about balancing these two. Yeah, absolutely. I think that, uh, I mean, recently there's a, a, a few great examples out there in the region. If you look at uh, Assembly Square, the new development in Somerville, uh, you've seen uh, the creation of uh, and restoration of the Mystic River uh, coastline, uh, along with uh, a great mixed-use district, even though it's not done yet. it's If you go there, it's uh, very busy and bustling all the time. If you look at a, a city like Lawrence, uh, with all the mill redevelopment that's, that's happening up there, they've been able to improve uh, the, the run, lower the runoff and improve water quality at the same time that those mills are redeveloped and create a whole system of parks throughout the, throughout the city. Sure. Are you confident or how do you feel about this project in Cambridge? Can they do that if this moves forward? Um, well, again, not I wouldn't want to weigh in directly on this project because I see you know, the need for, for housing and my understanding is that the developer has permits in, in place. But I think Ted made a, a great point around uh, trying to find appropriate design solutions for the, for the context. I certainly understand where the neighbors are coming from there. And one thing that we try to do at the Smart Growth Alliance is encourage cities and towns to, to, to plan ahead and put the, the rules and the zoning in place that will let them be more proactive about growing where it makes sense to grow and preserving the special features of their community sure. before it gets to these kinds of battles. Now, as a member of the BRA, are you going to make sure that happens in Boston now? Well, we're going to be working very hard on that. A number of people uh, have been working for a number of years on greening the city, reducing energy consumption, uh, creating uh, spaces and uh, buildings that are more environmentally sensitive. Uh, the state has been working hard on this, and so is 
Kansas City, and I expect we're going to see more innovative work being done in that uh, in that way. There are ways of essentially recycling energy and recycling all of the forces in ways that are beneficial, and I think that that's something that we need to take a very hard look at. Let me ask you, uh, you know, everywhere you look in the city of Boston, there's a crane. Uh, are you concerned that this is happening awfully quickly? A lot of, of construction, a lot of moving forward. How do you feel about it? There was a great deal of work that was approved towards the end of the prior administration. And that work uh, was in the pipeline for a while for economic reasons. And a lot of it is going on right now. There's no question of that. We're seeing investment from throughout the United States and abroad. Um, and some of the highest real estate prices um, uh, that we've ever seen in the city as the city is growing and expanding. Uh, Mayor Walsh is committed uh, to not slowing uh, the progress of work that is already ongoing. Uh, but it's also clear that we need to take a hard look at the planning functions at the Redevelopment Authority and to really dig into what it takes for the city to think about itself five years from now and ten years from now. We've not had a comprehensive zoning and city plan in the city since 1964. And that means that a lot of work goes forward in a very ad hoc way. And I think one of the priorities is going to be to develop a comprehensive plan in an inclusive way uh, that would permit us to move forward with coherence and with sensitivity to the environment. And Andre, I'm assuming you would applaud that. Absolutely. I mean, I think we have to have some creative strategies now. To we don't have we're not a, a region with a lot of space, so mm -hmm. we can't grow out. We have to retrofit tired commercial areas. We need to think about new things like micro units uh, in places where there's a lot of demand. Sure. Well, gentlemen, it's really interesting, and, and this is going to be a story we'll be following for a long time because this is going to be a project that's going to move certainly into the future. Thank you both so much. Thank for you. Being very much. Thank you. It's good to see you both.